Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me are News Editor Tung. Hello. And Senior Journalist Richard. Bonjour. This week, we're discussing the rise and rise of Toyota GR's, uh, Toyota's GR Performance brand. We'll look at three recent entrants to the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with a rocket enthusiast that's proud to wear plaid in this week's Musk Watch. Um, look, you can jump ahead with the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. But for the time being, stay with us. Um, first of all, we want to talk about um, this week's main topic, a story that our own Andrew Chesterton authored through the week, caught of a lot of attention, and um, it's about Toyota's GR performance brand. And we've seen the tip of what appears to be a coming iceberg on, on GR performance. Uh, and he heard or was, was talking with Sean Hanley, who's the sales and marketing chief for Toyota in Australia, who actually mentioned that in the next 12 months, we'd see, quote, new GR high performance sports cars uh, arrive in Australia. Now, Chesto's theory is that that may actually be updated versions of the GR Supra that we've already got, um, the rally version of the Yaris. But he then went digging to see what it could mean in terms of cars that are this year or tipping into the next couple um, just down the track. So uh, we thought it'd be interesting to investigate that. And uh, the first one is that Toyota GR Yaris Rally, um, which is the same uh, drivetrain as the GR Yaris that we already know. But uh, Tung, it, it brings in some uh, suspension tuning. It's got a Torsen yep. diff. Uh, it's got all kinds of stuff. What, what are your thoughts on that car? I, I don't think it's going to be very day-to-day, -day, daily drive friendly. No, no. It's just meant to be a little bit more hardcore than the regular GR Yaris. Uh, you know, it's got some limited slip diffs on it, some stickier rubber as well, uh, and a bigger price tag to match. But, uh, you know, JC, you did, the, uh, you did the launch for the GR Yaris. Do you think that car needs like a little bit I, performance I don't know. I thought I thought it was pretty great. <laughs> um, yeah. If you were if you were going to put it onto a circuit for track days and things, I reckon it would already go well. You'd maybe just yeah. play with your tire pressures to to improve its performance there. Um, whether or not you need or the extra hard super hard suspension, you have to be pretty dedicated um, to heading to the racetrack on a regular basis. And especially if you want to pay more money. Um, so I don't know. But, um, but Richard, they're going to be playing with the, the pricing in a similar way to the first time the GI Yaris arrived. First 200, a certain price. What is it? 56,200 drive away. And after they're gone, it's moving to 54,500 plus on-road costs. So they're playing um, silly buggers with the pricing again. It's a lot of money for a car, which is uh, just four meters long, isn't it? Um, and <laughs> yes, just in in quantity of steel and rubber <laughs> and glass. Well, that's it. I've always, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, assessed a car by how much car yeah. you get for your money. Yeah, it's like uh, the scales in the grocery right. part of the supermarket. You want to be able to weigh your car and determine whether you're getting value. <laughs> that's right. You, your car for money yeah, uh, yeah. equation is yeah. You know, <laughs> Not very high with the with the Yaris. Look, you, as 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 Tung said, you've you've driven. Um, you know, you were one of the first in Australia to drive the car. Um, I mean, how much better could this car be? Um, yeah. Is it necessary? I get a feeling that Toyota is bringing it out just because it can. Mm. Uh, and you know, uh, Hyundai and Kia are, are now hot on uh, Toyota's heels. And I think Toyota is doing what any Olympic sprinter would do, and that is actually just sprinting ahead as hard as it can to put, yeah. make that gap as, as as far as possible. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, it, it's also going to be a car, a little bit of bragging rights, you yeah. know, oh, I've got the rally. I've got the rally version. I've got the hard version. But the problem with that, and not that I've driven the, the rally yet, none, none of us have, mm. um, I just think it's potentially a compromised driving experience. <laughs> you know, you, you're paying more money, you're getting the harder car. But the standard one, such as it is, is so great. I, I, I don't see it myself. I think they've, they've put themselves in a really awkward position. And, you know, part of Chesto's story, he mentions uh, down the line, they might bring out a GR version of the Corolla. And if the GR Yaris or the GR 
you know, Yaris Rally is costing $55,000. Yeah, yeah. Where are they going to position mm. GR Corolla? Yeah, that's right. I oh, will. And that's it. let's move on to the Corolla because I think it's a, it's a really interesting looking car. I think the consensus is that the current generation Corolla has taken a more adventurous step in terms of its design, particularly on the exterior. And with the beefiness that it might pick up uh, of that drivetrain, maybe they play with the tracks again and, and, and bulk up the guards and make it look a little tougher. I reckon that'll be a great car. That'd be one definitely to look forward to. Like when, was, when was the last time they did a hot Corolla? Was oh. it like Corolla Sportivo? Uh, uh, 2004, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, what would it be? Late 80s? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the, with the Seeker. 1.6 twin Six cams. Cam. And, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that good car. Stuff. I think, you know, Very we're seeing, car. we're seeing, uh, you know, Hyundai enter the hot hatch market. Uh, you know, Honda is, Honda Australia is back in the hot hatch market now. You know, it was, it was going to be a matter of time before Toyota sort of came back into that space and offered yeah. something that, that rivaled the i30N and, you know, maybe yeah. even the Civic Type R, right? Yeah. Yeah, too right. I mean, yeah. in his story, Chesto makes the point that the Corolla, a GR Corolla, could be a 2021 reveal um, that would put it in market probably next year. But the brand has already trademarked the name GR Corolla. Like, it's, it's going to happen. And there's been a lot of chat about that drivetrain just being put in. So that's, that's one I'm looking forward to. Just a little more breathing room. But the same kind of dynamic would be amazing. It's really interesting because nothing, Toyota doesn't do anything by accident. And I know that sounds like a really silly thing to say, but we all know that they're quite a traditional brand. They have really long model uh, cycles. I think the, the, the whole GR movement has been in the works for a long time, um, yep. way before, you know, the pandemic and, and anything like that. So their role and, and being a brand, you know, as they are, they're just moving ahead with 2021's plan. Yeah. Um, and they've known for years that, you know, they've, they've got a quite a bit of rivalry in the market now. I mean, n- not from, you know, traditional players like Nissan, but like, as I mentioned before, Kia and, and uh, Hyundai. Yep. Uh, they're trying to get ahead of their end game and uh, anything that Kia might have coming, which is a bit sporty. Yep. Um, and I think they're doing it. I think they're going to crash them. Well, I mean, GR uh, Gazoo um, is so mm. close to Akio Toyota's heart. He started it. Um, mm. as a much younger man, and it's morphed into this whole performance thing. Um, he, he's the driver, literally and figuratively, um, mm. of this whole thing. And it's it's part of the new Toyota that he's trying to create, one yep. that's more interesting um, and a little more dynamic in its personality, as well as its particular, you know, product performance. Um I think yeah, scare, I think what may may scare some brands is ending up in the wilderness. Like um, you know, I think Honda is to a, to a degree, um, and it's a, a really a really good brand, a really brand with a lot of um, you know cachet behind its name. Um, produces high quality vehicles um, and some really great ones over the years, like the NSX. Um, yeah. But appears to be kind of a little bit lost. Uh, yes. Whereas Toyota know, seems to know exactly where it's going and it yeah. seems to have everybody covered, whether they're a family, you know, yeah. an older person or a young person. I think it's really clever. Well, uh, it's potentially um, a factor of just finances. You mm. know, it, it's okay to be brave if you can be a, afford to be. Mm. And, and when Honda was successful, it was in Formula One, it was mm. in, you know, IndyCar racing in the States, all forms of motorsport a lot of forms of motorsport and they were cycling their engineers through those programs. So they yeah. go out into, into motorsport, come back into the company and you had cars like the NSX, various mm. um, sporty civics and things mm. coming through and, you know, financial hard times fall yep. and they're the first things to go. That's right. Um, because they're seen as extraneous, but they can actually be part of the DNA of the brand. Yep. And yep. that's, I think what we're seeing grow with Toyota at the moment. Yeah. I mean, Power of dreams. You mentioned yeah. motorsport, but they just did they just come out with a, a new Le Mans racer? Yeah, I don't really yeah, the hypercar, <laughs> the the, uh, the the hypercar class uh, <laughs> at Le Mans. Is this going to be a road going? Mm. Be a road going version of that? Yeah, car? yeah, like, exactly. This yeah. is Toyota who make like, hybrid Corollas, and they're coming out with like a genuine supercar. What is yeah. going on? Well, it's it's I, just to harp on it again. It's Akio Toyota with this vision of what mm. Toyota is going to be. And he started banging on about this a few years ago. And everyone's was like, yeah, yeah, good on you. Um, you know, just, just improve the Camry, you know. And, and, <laughs> and now 
all of that stuff is coming to fruition because he actually has been pushing the company to do things differently. And I think we're starting to see a few years down the track, all of that actually coming to fruition. Are we going to see a GR version of the Camry? That's what I want to know. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, look, one other, th- one, other one that uh, Chesto pointed to is a GRMN Supra um, that, again, could see the light of day maybe as a, as a concept or a prototype uh, during this year. Now, pro- probably most of our listeners know that GR stands for Gazoo Racing, which is now the umbrella under which all of Toyota's performance cars and motorsport <clears throat> uh, falls. And then MN stands for Master of Nürburgring. So <laughs> GRMN, Gazoo Racing, Master of Nürburgring. Um, and that means you go that extra distance in terms of performance. So this thing could potentially have the M4's uh, inline six, you know, twin turbo inline six in it uh, with as much as 375 kilowatts, which is over 500 horsepower. So if we had a GRMN Supra uh, late 2021 reveal available sometime in 2022, that would be incredible. All that I have is to say nuts. is they better offer it in orange with a giant <laughs> thing. <laughs> no, uh, like, JC, you did the launch of the Supra as well. They, they've been promising that every year there's going to be an update yep. to this car, right? Yep. Well, Tetsu uh, uh, Tada, Tada-san said, yes, we're going to... He, the way he positioned it was like um, Porsche with the 911. You know, every year there's some, there's a Carrera, Carrera S, there's a GTS, there's a blah. So he, he wants the Supra, uh, Supra to evolve in that same way. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've, we've seen that, I suppose. We've had little updates uh, during yeah. the course of 2020, but 2021 might be an absolute whopper. You know, yeah, if it's we the GRMN, that'd be amazing. We went from 250 kilowatts from the launch car to 285 yeah. kilowatts now. And then a jump up to what was it, 300 and 375, or, just 375. a lazy 375. Yeah. That's crazy. Is, but it's all it's always felt, I must say, having driven the the launch car around Phillip Island, which is a pretty epic layout, and mm. you, you really can feel the balance of a car through some of those fast sweeping bends that are on that circuit. Yeah. It feels so balanced and actually capable of taking more. So I, I think that platform has been set up to cope with a lot more grunt and yep. to you, it, it would be uh, your, in, interesting to see it. What did you get through turn uh, turn one in it, JC? Oh, I don't know. I had my eyes eye <laughs> shut at that point. I mean, it was just, <laughs> just, just hoping. <laughs> no, but it, um, yeah. it, it is a, you know, it's, it's mm. a joint effort, of course, um, BMW and Toyota, but um, just on the basis that super, it felt fantastic and it did feel as though it could, could cope with more. So we'll, we'll see, I suppose. And uh, do you know what? It's it's still going to look a whole lot more exciting uh, than a Z4 as well. Or uh, yeah, yeah. I actually yeah. personally <laughs> like the look of a Z4. So 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 do oh, I. So do I. Man, it's just it's I don't know. It's, it it's was not designed very, by it's, an Aussie. It was designed by an Aussie. Rich, does that? Does so that what? You know, does <laughs> it matter? So I was, was the hills hoist, and that looks like crap. <laughs> but it's very efficient. <laughs> Um, it I, is. I um, was in traffic uh, with one just the other day and I, I'm kind of with you, Tong. I thought it looked pretty arresting, if you know what I mean. It was quite, a, quite an eye catch. Uh, it doesn't have the hips. It doesn't have the curves. It doesn't have the ooh-la-la of the Supra. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, it's, that, maybe that will be on the options list with the RMN. <laughs> I want some ooh-la-la. Ooh-la-la. Oh, yeah. Oh. I just love uh, all the bits. You know, all the little, <laughs> little bits you can put your, yeah, it's, you know, ugh, ugh, love it. Well, look, love another it. another one that's potentially, this is another one that uh, Chesto has been digging around on is, of course, the Land Cruiser. And we've had a lot of interest mm. um, in the transition, which is not too far away. I know we've been saying that for a long time, uh, between the 200 series and the 300 series Land Cruiser. So he's putting it out there, a GR Sport version of the 300 Land Cruiser. Um, now, wow. he's picking up on media reports in Japan. He's been um, fine-tuning his Japanese, obviously. Um, and <laughs> it's pointing to... Konnichi wa? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Domo Arigato. Arigato. Yeah. And he, he's, um, he's put, he says that those reports are pointing to engineering upgrades that focus on retuning the suspension and mm. more dynamic handling rather than more power. But having said that, uh, the likely power plant would be this V6, much talked about V6, so a 3.3 litre unit in a GR-tuned Land Cruiser would be an interesting package too. 
Wow, surely that's marketed at the Middle East rather than Australia. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, could could be. Who knows? I mean, yeah. you're saying it wouldn't sell well in Australia because I think uh, it would. I think it would. I too. don't know. I don't know. Like, I think Land Cruiser buyers in Australia, are, you know, National Party voters most likely. Um, I, not uh, not that there's you know, anything wrong with nothing. That, there's nothing we're, wrong with it. Nothing we're wrong. apolitical here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> We're, we're, it's party, a, it's we're a, party neutral. Yeah, we are. We are. Distinction, uh, the GR Sport brand from just ah, regular GR. Yeah, um, good point, good point. So, you yeah, know, the GR Sport is just going to be that suspension and cosmetic tuning. Yeah. More so than engine enhancements and, and yeah. performance changes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we've seen it in the CHR, which has just recently come out with the GR Sport version that literally just has wheels, a body kit, and still uses the same hybrid engine. So... You know, but, yeah. I mean, but isn't this going to cut down it? its off-road capability? You don't want a body kit on a Land Cruiser. <laughs> if anything, you need, you know, you need ground clearance. You don't need firm suspension. You need soft and, you know, good off-road suspension. I just think, I think it's silly. I I'd argue, and I agree, everyone would agree with me as well. <laughs> I'd, I'd argue that um, most Land Cruisers don't really get their feet wet, as it were. They, te- they tend to... <laughs> oh. they, they tend to stay uh, in the in the suburban and urban jungle. I ch- I challenge you on that. I reckon <laughs> I reckon Prados probably, but Land Cruisers. I reckon I reckon outback Australia. Oh I yeah. Oh look, that that's true. Certainly, you go uh, mm. north of a certain uh, latitude, and yeah. the Land Cruiser ratio starts to go up appreciably. I, yeah. I, I do get that. I think a large number of them are for towing, be it a van yes. or or a boat. Yep. And maybe someone who's into that Land Cruiser zone just wants it to have that extra, you know, pizzazz, ooh-la-la factor, Richard, <laughs> um, in terms of the, the way it looks. Um, and maybe it's something about extra stability. It might be tuning the handling to perform better off-road or it might be an on-road thing. Who's to say? So You reckon they'll hold the launch at Phillip Island? <laughs> no. Can you imagine? No. Six- Toyota Land Cruisers going around Phillip Island. I Which think one be, would fall off into Bass Strait first? That I think it would be, be better um, at a boat ramp. I think you could just have, <laughs> you know, line up half a dozen uh, Land Cruisers and see who can jockey the trailer and get their boat out of the water. Oh, hey, Jeep, stuff, Jeep, stuff. Launched, Jeep launched the Grand Cherokee uh, Trackhawk at Phillip Island. So yes, they did. You know, I was, I was there. That, that, that was quite an experience Uh <laughs> Flinging that beast around that layout was hilarious. None of them but, landed in the water, so no, no. no. Look, the despite, handling despite need... best efforts, I must say. <laughs> Look, the handling doesn't need to improve. They need to produce like an amphibious version of the Land right. Cruiser, an amphicar style yeah. Land Cruiser, yeah, like straight an army into the duck. Water. An army duck. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, yeah. let's get that on the table. Mm. We'll mock something up, get it off to Toyota, and I'm sure they'll be working on it. Sean, by the time. Sh- Sean would love an amphibious. Yeah, he would. Cruiser. Mm. Now, look, just to round it out, um, the last bit of Chesto's investigation was around, of course, the Hilux and potentially a spin-off to the Fortuna. And that's something that we've been talking about for some time. What he has established is that it's unlikely before the next-gen Hilux arrives, which is around 2023. So there could be, Tung, you know, there could be a, a GR, um, uh, what do we call it, GR line, um, rather than a, a full-on GR model, GR Sport, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Um, so who's to rule that out? But a, a proper GR version of the Hilux. Um, again, we'd be thinking um, a big engine, though. He's been digging around, and the next-gen car is likely to have a 3.3-litre diesel V6 um, at its disposal. And you've already seen in the States vehicles like the Tacoma and Sequoia uh, TRD versions of those, which uh, we would see as GR, fitted with things like Fox shock, shocks and pretty serious off-road type gear. So, you know, when that arrives in a couple of years' time, I would think that would have a pretty strong market. I mean, the Ford Ranger Raptor has been an absolute runaway success. It has. And I'm sure every single other brand who produces a Ute is looking at that car going, how do we tap into that market? Yeah. You know, and Toyota has tried, uh, you know, it's got its Rogue, it's got its Rugged X, they're kind of like Australian homegrown, uh, you know, bolt-on special. Yeah. To really challenge a car like the Ranger Raptor, you need something from the ground up built, you know, yep. like yep. the Ranger Raptor to take, um, you know, to go off-roading at pace. So, mm. 
I, th- uh, I think I think that's a really good point, Tung. It's not to be underestimated the impact that the Ranger Raptor has had. Everybody is obviously scrambling um, to get something that's that's like it. And yeah, Toyota will be one of those. So it'll be an interesting well, space at, to watch. The Raptor looks like it's ready for Baja. Do you know what I mean? Whereas yeah. those those um, dressed up versions of the Hilux look like dressed up versions of the Hilux. I yeah. think people are smart enough to see through, you know, the lipstick and makeup. Um, yeah. But I, uh, you know, so, I, says says the man with the Dumb and Dumber dog uh, <laughs> truck behind him. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, look. I, I, I poo pooed uh, the uh, idea of a, a GR high, uh, Land Cruiser, but I absolutely reckon a GR version of the Hilux is vital. Yeah. Um, more yeah, vital, but I think, than possibly um, any of the other GR models that Toyota might have. Um, yeah. They need, yeah. To, they need to meet Raptor um, yeah. because Raptor has, as, as Tung said, has been a runaway success. Uh, it looks like a monster and that's what people want. And I, I found it interesting, I don't know about you guys, but I found it interesting that there's been so little resistance to the idea of a two-litre four-cylinder engine powering the Raptor. You know, it seemed to me like yeah. it needed something that on it, paper had a bit more kind of balls. It and, does. And, it, and it, no one, they've been buying them hand over fist. That's really annoyed me that people haven't put up more resistance to it. It needs, <laughs> it needs the coyote <laughs> engine. It needs, it needs a five litre V8. It honestly does to, to match its looks. Rumor, rumor is next generation, it's going to go to a V6. So, right. Well, know, there you go. So that would align what, with the, the Camry the like V6. <laughs> <laughs> So we'd have, we'd potentially have a V6 uh, Ranger Raptor and a V6 Hilux GR. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be kind of interesting. Well, look, it'd be great to get everybody's thoughts, people watching and listening as to where they sit with the whole GR thing, which of the, the vehicles we've spoken about um, are you for or against to be, uh, be great to get your thoughts and, uh, and join in the conversation. But for now, Thank you for that, guys. We're going to move on to our own garage with cars that you can buy and drive as of right now. And Tung, I would like to start with you. Yep. You've been in something that most definitely isn't a Hilux or a Ranger. Could you fill us in, please? Absolutely. I've been uh, fortunate enough to be behind the wheel of a Mercedes AMG GLA 45S. Uh, so that's sort of the second... It's. It, top spec version of the second generation GLA. Um, and, you know, it shares the same engine as the A45 hot hatch. Uh, so you get 310 kilowatts, 500 newton meters out of a two liter four cylinder turbo petrol, which is In- just incredible. Mental. Just ma- madness. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But you also get a more practical body style. Uh, so the boots about 15% bigger than the hatch. Uh, you know, the suspension is obviously a bit taller, so it makes it a little bit more comfortable around town. Um, I, Absolutely adore that car. It makes no sense whatsoever because <laughs> yes. you can you, you either look at it as a, a more practical hot hatch or a really fast small SUV. Mm. Either way you look at it, it does it really well. Yes, isn't yeah. that amazing? You know, yeah. it's it's so much a sign of the market that those hot compact SUVs are a thing because yeah. you know, in terms of engineering and physics, they probably shouldn't be. Um, no. but, but they definitely are. And then they're still super fun uh, to, yeah. to pilot around. Totally, no, I, I, totally. I drive the GLA 35, which is kind of the, the diet version of that, isn't it? Um, yep. Doesn't have the same sort of, you know, firm suspension, but it still sounds good, still goes quite well. Yeah. Um, but I've got to agree with you. I think the, um, the A45 is really limiting, isn't it, in terms of its mm. size and its practicality, especially if you've got a family. I think you'd yep. get away with a GLA 45 with a family. Um, mm. a small one. It's got enough space. Yeah. Mm. But I, just I to... This, just, sorry, go ahead, Tom. I, I made this point in my review. It's, you know, would you buy a hatchback or would you buy an SUV right now? And the majority of people are going to pick an SUV. So why, why not get a performance SUV? You sure. Know? And, uh, I mean, Australia's appetite for AMG product is almost insatiable. Um, in terms of a, a percentage of sales in Australia that AMG, it's the highest in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so uptake of AMG as a percentage of overall sales for, for Mercedes-Benz. But uh, it's interesting, Richard, you make the point about the, 
so-called lesser models you know a, a 30 it's 35 isn't it yeah um, in the in the a class and and its derivatives mm. but same with the 43 you know in c class for example mm. i think they stand apart as a really good option and they have their own individual niche to fill it's not as if you're actually getting to second best i think it's aspirational in its own right because they are so comfortable, yet they do have that performance edge. They're for a particular type of person that doesn't want all the fiery thunder of the of the top performance model, but still wants a bit of something in their daily drive. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, the, the hard, hard, hardcore versions can sometimes be, you know, we only have these vehicles normally for a week or so, but by the end of the week, it, they do become a bit brutal. Um, you know, the, the ride and the, you know, the full fat AMGs. Yeah. And then you, then you step into the half fat AMGs and you're like, actually, this is not a watered down version. This is actually a more livable version. I know. That it's, a, it's a yeah. perfectly valid option in its own right. Yeah. It, it, it yeah. does stand apart. So, mm. but, but overall, Tung, what about it as a, as a day-to-day prospect? You, you think it would be uh, livable? I think it was perfectly fine. Um, I'm yep. quite used to Hard of riding cars though <laughs> and I, yes. I, can, I can live with that you know um, yeah. is it going to be as comfortable as you know the 35 or a GLA 250 of course not of yeah. course not but yeah you know the boot's really big you got usable back seats uh yeah. and it was perfectly fine around town for me I, I often totally find it's it. the um it's the significant other factor in the passenger yep. seat that tends to uh let you know where mm. things are in terms of the comfort or otherwise mm. of the car the Look, significant wife, other is always is really important because <laughs> when you drive a car and it's and it's firm, you're kind of distracted by how much what? fun it is to drive. But <laughs> your passengers will let you know the truth. Yeah, <laughs> my wife they didn't will. even realise it was a sporty car until I turned the active exhaust on. So interesting, interesting. It passes that test. There you go. Well, she's obviously used to uh, your preferences in terms of yeah. <laughs> cars. Then, Tung. <laughs> now um, we will move on. Thank you very much, Tung. Uh, We'll move on to you, Richard. And you have been into a brand new model. We've only just uh, published details of it. Um, It's from Korea. Please tell us about it. Yes, brand new for Australia, uh, but it's been out overseas for a couple of years now. Okay. Um, It's the Kia Stonic. Um, yep. You don't have to say it like that. It's it has three S's it. and an H before the T. <laughs> it's astonic. Like yep. all Kias, it's got a it's got a bit of a strange name. Um, look, it's based on it's a small SUV. It's the smallest SUV that Kia now have in their liner. It's based on the little Kia Rio hatch. Uh, it doesn't look a lot like a Rio. Um, this, they've done a pretty good job of. Uh, you know, uh, styling it so that it doesn't look exactly the same as just a, a, a Rio hatch on on stilts. Uh, it's I drive the GT line, which is the sportier version, and it is actually more than just a body kit. Uh, Kia have given a better handling, different suspension setup to the to the S and the sport grades, which are below it. Um, Look, it's priced really well. It starts at the, the entry grade starts at around twenty one, twenty two thousand wow. dollars. Yeah, wow. It's very difficult to find another tiny SUV at that price with the same amount of features and safety tech. Safety is an interesting one because it adopts the five-star ANCAP rating of the Rio from wow. 2017. What? I see. That's yeah. very dodgy. That sounds it, a bit uh, a bit of a reach. It sounds a bit dodgy. We asked, you know, of, of course, being the media in the press conference, we asked them why they didn't give us a, a five, uh, give us an ANCAP rating for 2021. And they a- answered quite honestly. And they said, it's really expensive to crash a car. Uh, they were quite happy to adopt that five-star rating from 2017. But we know that it wouldn't get a five-star by today's standards because you need a centre airbag just for starters to get a five-star ANCAP yeah, rating. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, I think we've made, sorry, just to digress for a sec. Mm. Um as I understand it, it's a side head impact criteria in yep. ANCAP's assessment. Yep. And one way to meet that criteria is putting in a centre airbag. Yes. Whether you do or not is not necessarily ah, the determining factor. Right. It's okay. Most brands have come up with the solution of a centre airbag. Got it. Got um, it. But, but it's almost a question for ANCAP, isn't it? Yeah. You know, what, why are you willing uh, to let a four-year-old standard run with a new model? That's it. Look, we got the feeling that 
a, a new Stonic will be arriving in the next two or three years or something like that. So I think Kia are quite happy to adopt that old ANCAP rating for the Rio and then we'll get a five-star or we'll get an ANCAP rating when the 2026 Stonic comes out. Right. Just, in, in right, a, just in to butt in, in I, I actually asked ANCAP that question. Yeah, why good, do good, they good. adopt these older standards? Yep. And yep. they say simply because they don't have the time and the money and the resources to do it. Wow. And it's much better to put a rating on a new car, even if it's, you know, from two or three or four years ago or from Euro NCAP, uh, you know, uh, the European equivalent of NCAP, than it is to bring the car to market without any safety rating I and see. Give, give consumers no guidance on that safety yes. front. Yes, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, you know, NCAP is such a consumer-focused organisation, um, but yet they're hamstrung by time and finance and, and mm -hmm. on occasion can't really do the job they'd like to do. Yeah, I'm sure that's Aren't a big frustration. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but the, at the same time, it's probably the most important factor in a car, mm -hmm. and that's you know safety. It's people's lives. So yeah. look, should yeah. should ANCAP ratings have an expiry date? You know, oh, uh, uh, is yeah. something from 2017 still well, valid? Well, I think they do, but it's quite a mm -hmm. long period. It's like eight years, which is longer yeah. than a typical car's model cycle. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so totally. Uh, yeah, it's odd. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, again, just to digress for a minute. I remember when ANCAP ratings first started to appear and most car brands were hugely defensive and reluctant to get involved because mm. what they were saying was at that stage, ANCAP was testing one car in one type of test. It was a very simple and straightforward test. They said, we do hundreds of theoretical, possibly thousands of theoretical tests validated by physical you know, crash assessment. Our processes are far superior to yours. But over time, of course, ANCAP and uh, Euro ANCAP have become more sophisticated and now manufacturers kind of live and die by w whether or not that rating is in their favour. Um, it's been quite a change. Yeah, abs absolutely. I've, I've heard of brands flat out refusing to bring certain cars yep. to Australia because they know that it's not going to get a yep. five-star ANCAP safety rating. That's mm. right. It's that critical um, yeah. from a consumer point of view. Yeah, it's become the, the standard. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, well um, anything else to add on that, Richard? Yeah. Look, I mean, talking of the standard, Kia's, become, you know, set, you know, in, you know, in their defence, they've kind of set the standard in a lot of ways. One with Hyundai in terms of safety, and you know, a car yep. that's only you know twenty two or twenty one thousand dollars still mm. comes with mm. you know pedestrian and cyclist detection with AEB. Um, so it's still still pretty impressive at that front. Two engines, 1.4 litre and a one litre. Uh, the oh, I, thought you were, I thought it had two engines in one car at the stage. So that, would be that would be awesome. That would be awesome. One at the back, one at the front. <laughs> yeah. No, two at the front. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, look, I wish it did. There wouldn't be enough room. There, that's a, <laughs> uh, yeah, look, the GT line's got a one litre three cylinder um, and a dual clutch. Now, I've driven small SUVs where that combination can be not quite. Uh, as smooth as you want it to be. Um, but the um, GT line does a pretty good job of, uh, uh, of, of the smoothness when it comes to gear, gear changes. Um, one of the things which is really interesting is that uh, Hyundai are sort of phasing out local engineering in terms of testing their vehicles uh, on Australian roads. They're going to wow. a global tune. Yeah. Uh, but Kia um, are maintaining that local engineering side of things and when i when i say that i mean actually driving the cars in australia and then through trial and error just changing the shocks and the springs to to get the right combination right um and the testing for this car was done just before covid hit so the ride in this in the in the stonic is is excellent like it's so right. well suited to australian right. roads and the steering the, the steering in this car is the best thing about it um they've gone into a lot of detail about how they've increased the number of teeth uh, in the uh, rack and pinion, and you and it, and it feels great. I, I, I jumped out of that car and into the Seltos, which is the the larger SUV in Kia's range, um, the next next step up from the the Stonic, and the the Seltos steering isn't quite as good. So right. um, it's a good car. So yeah, Stonic out now. <laughs> <laughs> out, no, issue one, issue, issue one, out now. <laughs> now, um, I'll, I'll uh, finish up with, I've been in a Merc 2. This one's the E300 sedan, which, which when you think about it, was once, you know, Mercedes-Benz's bread and butter um, mm. in this market. That was, that was a very popular car for them. Not so much these days. It's, it's $117,000 and it's a two-litre um, turbo petrol now. Uh, and nine-speed auto, rear-wheel drive. It remains rear-wheel drive. 
Um, so it's producing 190 kilowatts and 370 unit, newton meters, which is which is pretty good output for a two liter uh, four cylinder. That torque is all available from uh, around 1800 RPM. It'll go naught to 100 in a little under seven seconds, which is which is pretty quick for you know a, an outwardly yeah. fairly fairly conservative Merc sedan. Uh, and I found, speaking of of ride comfort, I found it incredibly comfy. Uh, it's double wishbones at the front, multi-link at the rear, which is a common Mercedes-Benz uh, setup. It runs on 20-inch rims, and yet it is just so comfortable. Really, that was an, an outstanding feature. And it's quick. You know, you've, you've got that torque load down. You've got nine ratios to cycle through, and it, it picks them up and just goes really nicely. It's a very easy car to drive. Uh, the good steering, great front seats, really comfortable and supportive front seats, and it, and it does exude very good quality. Um, I found on, on the not so good side, there, there's plenty of room in the back. There's lots of leg room and headroom, but getting in and out is just such a struggle. The door, the door aperture is just not big enough. And you're trying to get in and fold yourself in or, origami style. And then you've got to assume the same pose to get out. It is, it is just a bit of a struggle. Is that the uh, back door or the front door? That's the back door. I should have, I yeah. should have clarified that. I do, uh, I do beg your pardon, in, in the back. So um, yeah, plenty of room in the back, but getting in and out is a struggle. And also, Mercedes-Benz, uh, they're persisting with these small swipe controls on mm. the steering wheel to control onboard functions and, and readouts. And in this E300, it's a new style where rather than having a distinct button to swipe your thumb over, it's just a, a piece of a plastic panel within the wheel. Yep. And I wrote in my notes, tiny little swipes suck. Um, I just didn't enjoy this whole process. It was quite frustrating. And in fact, to change between, between um, screens, I found distracting mm. and it almost became a safety issue. So I'm just not a fan of, of that approach. It's, got, it's, it's a like, new, sorry, it's a new steering wheel as well, isn't it? It's got two yep. blades and yep. those swipe, they've moved from the black ones, which look like you've got, you put your thumbs in a seal's yep. eyes and, yep. and, yeah, that's and right. do that. Um, <laughs> and those black ones worked quite well, I they thought. Did. They um, did. But the new so, versions... Not quite as ergonomic. No, no, it's not. It, it, and there's nothing quite like, um, you know, going over where you want to want to be in yeah. terms of the readout, and then having to come back to, to get your teeth grinding. You know, and and that's not yeah. a good that's not a good mindset to be in when when you're driving down the road. Yep, yep. I was um, just going to say it's a it's a swiping generation now, JC. It's everyone's a swiping on generation. Tinder, yep. Everyone's oh, on hey. their phone. Is an E300 really a swiping generation car, though? Uh, like surely uh, their look. buyers are ninety plus years old. <laughs> yeah, look, don't look. That's very ageist of you, Richard. I think <laughs> I think people have a right to do whatever makes them happy. <laughs> so that would be interesting. As an extra little button, you put in a patch that has Tinder there as well, so you can actually just swipe yeah. as you go. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Now, um, that's finished our garage and we'll start looking at some of the feedback that we received uh, in response to last week's program, which was about Kia and whether or not Kia is potentially the one that could over time, maybe in this decade, start to make big inroads into Toyota's lead in the Australian market. Toyota dominates uh, Australian new car sales, but Kia has been just so much on the move. There's a lot of momentum with that brand. And uh, we were saying that particularly if um, they're successful in bringing a dual cab ute to this market and maybe a large off-road capable SUV four-wheel drive style vehicle that they'd really be on their way and they could do it. And Hammer Rocks came in and said Come that he, he agrees that Kia is a great example that attractive looking uh, products sell um, and that, that, that design, it's, it's somewhat design led. He says, why design products that need to grow on you? <coughs> cough, cough, BMW 4 Series. Um, why not design them to be instantly pretty? Um, Kia's designers obviously know this and it's working. And it, it got me thinking about the whole question of, yeah, okay, there are designs that grow on you over time. Is that part of a bigger picture play to add real integrity to a car brand that it, it has substance over time rather than being a pretty fashion, flash in the pan that is all the rage for five minutes and then goes away? It's, it's a really uh, tricky one to think about. Um, but but Tim Tim Burr Tim Burr eighty six uh, agreed, and he said, and quietly, I think they're a lot better looking than the big sister Hyundai's current design language as well, yeah. except for the Palisade. That thing is awesome. So, what do we make of of Hammer's uh, contention that Kia is winning? 
because they have terrific looking product. No, no. This is, this is a case of uh, Volkswagen and Skoda. I reckon, and this is just my own thoughts, as, as anything I say is, um, that Hyundai has been chosen as the brand which is going to lead the way and Kia is going to be your entry point into that sort of family. And like even having spoken to you know, the executives as well, they, Kia sees itself as that affordable but really great value um, end of the market, whereas mm-hmm. Hyundai... It's, you know, Palisade, all of that, it's going, it, it's going up market. I think it's going to, and I think in terms of sales, it wants that domination. I don't think Kia can, no. Really? I, I see the crossover point as being within the next few years where Kia will top Hyundai for sales. Kia will go but, lower. Kia will, Kia, will, Kia will bring out even more affordable. I reckon it'll go. Okay, yeah. that's, in, that's yeah. interesting. So their volume might be, might be greater, but their market positioning will yeah. be clear relative to Hyundai. That's right. Yeah. Okay, because Hyundai's done a lot of the heavy lifting in, in establishing, exactly. you know, Korean brands in this market. Sorry, Tom. We're seeing a lot of the brands move up market. Like you said, you know, like Hyundai is going up there, uh, Toyota, Mazda. Mazda. They're all, kind of, they're all getting yep. a little bit more expensive now. Kia seems to be the only mainstream brand that is happy to stay and play in that lower end. You know, Picanto, yep. Stonic, like you said, uh, yep. Rio, and it does it all with a seven-year warranty and styling that doesn't look hideous. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's Kia, true. Kia, Kia wants to be the LG of cars. <laughs> it does. <laughs> well, look, I'm saying it. That Carnival is a great-looking car. Um, I, never th- I never thought I'd say the words, but there they are. There they are. Mm. Um, look, MX Gregory said maybe 15 years ago, Kia was all at the place Chinese cars are now in Australia. Um, they are seen as uh, poorly made, uh, cheap cars. Now Kia is more popular than Holden was four years ago. And Lofty Visions agrees and says, much better built, smiley face. Uh, so there's, there's a fair bit of goodwill, as it were, out there for, for Kia. And to that point, Andre Vigeur says, I love Kia Telluride. They should bring it here in 4x4 version. And Greg Lamb chimed in and said, ditto, let's start a picket line. And I thought, that's interesting, a picket line. Rather than an online petition, it's just get the placards. Yeah, get out um, there. Out at Macquarie Park in Sydney where Kia's head office is and picket the joint so that they can I hope you're in. not inciting some type of insurrection, Jason. <laughs> bring in the like, Telluride. Well, look, we did see some skirmishes. People on YouTube will see a picture that we managed to snap um, out at uh, Kia's headquarters. Quite extra- extraordinary. Greg might be the, the um, genesis of all that, pardon the pun. Okay. Um, Raucous 919, I feel Kia could end up doing bundle deals. I thought this was a really interesting idea. Small hatch and a four-wheel drive ute, 60K drive away. Yes. Not many other companies would try to market that. I reckon that's a really interesting idea. That is such a Kia thing. They would do that. Yeah. You should get some type of commission for that, Ruckus. (laughs) Raucous? Ra- Raucous 919. Raucous. He might be a, a Porsche um, uh, sports car fan. Yeah. Okay. Now, George's channel, I am now on my third post-2010 Kia. So he's gone through Serato, Soul, Optima, and vouch for them as solid cars. However, I wouldn't touch the older used models. <laughs> I just wondered <laughs> if they're George's cars that are out there in the used market. He wouldn't touch the older ones. Mm. Um, now... <laughs> Limpun Singh 22 uh, says Kia is nice, but still light years behind Toyota in my back, my book. Kia hasn't proven anything yet. But uh, Ari and Ashley plays this great name says, how is that light years behind Toyota? Quality wise, they're better. Repackaging old tech is not ahead. And your old mate, uh, Richard de Kook agrees, hey. agrees that, uh, you know, Toyota's on a roll as well with, with um, they've had the RAV4, great product. Mm. Corolla's been a hit. Um, the GR Yaris, they're starting to, to get on a roll. But he thinks there could be some hiccups with uh, 300 Series Land Cruiser, whether enough buyers will be interested to, to take it up. So that's an interesting point. And um, just to finish it off, Adam Gill says, these videos aren't going anywhere and neither are my comments. See you in a few years, ladies. Last thing to say. So... <laughs> see, see, see you, Adam. See you. Thanks. What? It's like see you in a few years. See you in a few years. So we'll keep an eye out. Was and that from was Adam Gill? Was that sort of a senior executive at Cars Guide or something? <laughs> 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 All right. Well, uh, look, 
in terms of strange things to say, it's time for Musk Watch. Right. So very interesting. It's something that's been in the general news uh, this week. People who tuned in last week will remember that we spoke about um, a one word tweet or two word tweet from Elon. Uh, he's tweeted out use Signal. And in response to that, shares in the little known Texas health tech company called Signal Advance went up over 1,500% in a 24 hour period. What he was really tweeting about was um, an alternate to, I think it was WeChat or, or one of those uh, chat things. This small medical company was just bemused that their, their share price went <laughs> went through the roof overnight, which was just extraordinary. Um, so he's done it again, in a way. Uh, so he pumped five billion dollars into a stock through the week by uh, so the world's richest man, Elon, Elon Musk, on Wednesday morning, and this is courtesy of Yahoo Finance. Sent investors into a frenzy, pumping around four billion into ga video game retailer GameStop. Now we're familiar with GameStop. It's actually a Reddit uh, thread where these people have grouped together, there's about 2 million subscribers, to drive the price of this you know, game retailer up from the brink of disaster up to something much more impressive. Um, and it, it's gone up 92.71% in recent times. But then on Wednesday, Elon tweeted, game stonk, <laughs> just to get in on the action. And according to CNBC, the price of GameStop surged more than 60%. So he sent it up again. Gained around four billion dollars in market cap after that tweet. Oh my so, god! Yeah. So you had someone like Robert Reich um, on Instagram. He's a he's a high profile academic. Uh, he's an author, political commentator. He's a former government administrator. Summed it up. He said, "Stop worshiping billionaires." Elon Musk predicted the coronavirus would be gone seven months ago. These people don't know what they're talking about. So he's trying to get some calm um, in the market, and. Speaking of calm, what we're going to see very shortly, um, I think it's he's tweeted, Elon's tweeted, Plaid Model S ships next month. Yeah. He followed up with another tweet saying it can play cyberpunk. Uh, yes. First, first production car ever to achieve zero to 60 miles per hour in less than two seconds, 200 nice. mile per hour top speed bracket with the right tyres. So if you go to Tesla's website right now, there it is, the Plaid, 1,020 horsepower, the standing quarter in 9.23 seconds at 250 kmh, wow. and zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 2.1. So when you make the transition to kmh, wow. it's 2.1 seconds. Wow. Um, That's and insane. It, it is much, amazing. How much are we asking? Are uh, asking? Don't know. Do you know, Tom? Uh, great question. It's going to be 80,000 US. Two, right. Yeah. What so like what 150 Australian? I have no uh, idea. I've got I'm a feeling guessing. it might it'll probably be a bit more than that. But then yeah, in response to those tweets, you had lots of people wanting him to tweet about the AMC network, yeah. Dogecoin, Bitcoin, no, Blackberry, don't. Nokia, say something about these so that our He's gonna break everything. He's gonna <laughs> stuff everything up. Plate is Mac just under two hundred thousand dollars in Australia. Whoa. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So Magnus Hermanson said sent a really great little meme. Is that your phone? And a, a shot of the new interior of the new uh, updated Type S with a little Nokia phone on the console, which was, <laughs> which was pretty good. <laughs> Steve, now, the other feature of the updated S class more broadly, as well as the Plaid version, is that the interior has been redesigned dramatically and it looks quite different. And it's got an, a, a light plane style steering wheel. So it it's effectively has no top. Um, and just a couple of grips on the side. And for people on YouTube, we'll have pics of all that. Um, How does that fare in crash tests? That's what oh, I want to know. Oh, <laughs> various plane, people planes say. don't undergo crash tests because we know what happens when a plane they, crashes. Um, yeah, generally, but, generally it follows a particular pattern. <laughs> um, but in a car, because I know that in the 50s, they tried those steering wheels. Yeah. And, you know, I know people have got them, but they are yeah. potentially weapons. It's like, you know, holding Neptune's trident as you're driving. There, so. there, are, two, there are two things here. One, it's not going to be able to be sold in the EU with that type of wheel. I doubt it would make it to Australia with that type of steering wheel. Yep. And the second thing is it's trying to downplay the role of the steering wheel in the interior. So it's all <gasps> part, of the, part of the psychology that says this steering wheel is disappearing. 
They're trying okay, to take so away your driving rights. Take away people. our drive. Oh, <laughs> it's just a little psychological ploy. Yeah. But, um, Steve. Is Steve, it going to be like a little Austin Powers steering wheel in the in end? Well, <laughs> one, one little... person asked, why not a joystick? You know, what? Yeah. <laughs> you've already got it looking like the yoke of a, of a light plane. Yeah. Yeah. Who needs um, to drive when you can play cyberpunk in the car? Oh, well, Steve, Go- Steve Gunyan says, twice as fast, half as much steering wheel. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and Dilio, to Tung, you'll love this. Dilio says, I see Stardew Valley. That's all I need. <laughs> I've sucked way too many hours into that game. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, Dinesh says, that's awesome. But also sad as Model 3 is now the only car you can buy in Australia. Why not released? S and X is sometime in 2022. I went to the Australian version of the Tesla website and all of the various cars were still up and offered for sale, but delivery must be a well down the track kind of proposition. Have you got any mail on that, Tung? Have you heard anything about uh, uh, availability? No. I, thought, yeah. I thought everything was uh, still going ahead as planned. So it's uh, interesting. Dinesh makes that point. He may have been inquiring, you know, as a prospective customer. Yeah. All right. Now, speaking as we have of share prices rising, the Tesla share price has gone up just a bit um, since last week. 864. Uh, oh, no, down a bit, sorry. Uh, 864, no, up from 850. Beg your pardon. So it's gone up about $14. Um, but the Fin Review makes the point that they've made their jump to report their first annual profit. So this is in a calendar year. A uh, bit of a sales surge through the global pandemic. Uh, they earned $721 million, whereas at this time last year they had lost $862 million. So that is quite a turnaround. But the one point to make is that they still needed regulatory credits um, purchased by other automakers in order to make a, a profit. Um, without that, uh, the, without the $1.3 billion in credits for the year, they would have lost money. So it's the likes of GM and Ford and others that can't make their, their um, emissions uh, ratings that buy those credits from Tesla. And that's a big stream of income for the company. Do we have any news on upcoming Cybertruck and few other bits and pieces. JC well, and it was interesting. We touched on Cybertruck last last week where uh, a prospective customer said, I can't believe I'm going to have my Cybertruck in 2021. It's just like a DeLorean. I never thought I'd be buying a, another stainless steel car. Um, and Matt Farah uh, chimed in and said, I bet you a DeLorean you won't, you know, have it in yeah. 2021. Yeah. So yeah. That'll, that'll be interesting to see whether it arrives um, during this year. And I think... And I was going to say what form it arrives in because talking about a half steering wheel not being yeah. uh, kosher in various markets, that Cybertruck looks like a pedestrian disaster um, waiting to happen. I think it needs to, and it, I think something along those lines, the Cybertruck especially needs to arrive. I think right. this year, like, yeah. or, or what other um, yeah. stunts are we going to see from Elon? Like we had the Cybertruck yeah. last year with the smashed, you know, window. Um, yeah, with the yep. ball being thrown, steel ball being thrown into it. What are we yep. going to see this year from, from exactly Elon? Well, look, um, look, it's worth. I really enjoyed uh, the Roadster hitting the market mm-hmm. last year because yep. that, that's when it was meant to happen. Yep. I think the the, <laughs> the the semi, the semi truck, uh, semi. Was, was due about now. It hasn't happened. I mean, plenty is happening in Tesla. Don't get me wrong. Of yeah. course, he's building huge factories and pumping out cars, but some of those over promises are biting a little hard right now. Yeah, I just wonder if uh, a, a couple of the more traditional manufacturers are going to sort of beat him now that we've got Audi doing e-trons, uh, you know, BMW, and Mercedes. Mercedes. Um, we're going to have Rivian uh, dropping out of the sky very shortly. Um, wow, just well, like planes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, look out, look out everybody. Um, I'm just yeah. wondering, um, yeah. will, will, it, will 2021 be the end of Tesla being this disruptor and yep. unique, yep. Um, will it get lost in the wash of yes. an electric? Well, that, that's that's the challenge, yeah. isn't it? In terms mm. of being first mover in a market, you have that advantage for a certain period of time. Yeah. And you just know that others are either going to copy you or try and leapfrog you. And you have to try and stay ahead of that wave that's that's coming at you. So, yep. yeah, it'll be a challenging period, I'm sure. I think it's going to be the scariest year for Elon. Right. Okay, so there could be some kind of traumatic episodes. No, 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 I just reckon that this is going to be the year. This is really, we all thought with our Bloomberg tracker and Model 3 and all that, that it was make or break. Now, I reckon 2021 is the make or break for Tesla, really. Okay, he needs interesting. To, he needs to uh, 
come good on his promises. He's got three right. of them to keep. So what's your Tesla prediction for 2021, Richard? He needs to have a Cybertruck out. He needs to have the semi out and Roadster needs to be sold. This, this, well. year. this, this year. This year. Yeah, okay. All right. If Very not, good. it's all over. All right. Watch. It's all over. All right. <laughs> watch, watch, watch this space. Yeah. Um, but and until then, we have reached the finish line. And I want to say thank you, Richard. Thank you. And thank you, Tung. Thank you. And thanks to our in-house exorcist, salad dressing expert, and chief penguinologist, Mr. Pritchard, for his uncanny production skills. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, someone pass Shaggy the baggy so he can roll <laughs> Scooby a doobie. Love Dr. Boxer shorts and independently sprung sneakers. Ooh. Let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. Remember, you can also watch us on YouTube. And if you are already, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, just bought a, uh, a first aid kit uh, for the car. Thought I'd treat myself. Oh. <laughs> hey, JC, just for everybody out there as well, I've got something. Smile without you smiling your eyes. Now, raise your eyebrows. Now drop the smile. That's your model face. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't, think I'm get, I don't think I'm going to get booked very often <laughs> at all. I would argue that any face is Jay-Z's model face. <laughs> That's right. Uh, That's right. A model disaster. Yes, I learned that. I learned that on social media the other day. Very good. Thank you.